All right, what's up, guys? Uh, welcome back to the Florida Flyer. This is my first episode of uh, this brand new season. Uh, last year, I jumped in around training camp preseason time to give my thoughts and my feelings. And uh, this year, I decided to wait a little bit. Um, we had a lot of the team that didn't really play much during the preseason. It was a lot of the young kids got to play. So I, um, I decided that I was going to wait and give it a couple games into the season. And um, I felt like the 10-game mark was good. Um, I wanted to do one right after the Vegas win because I thought that was a huge win and that they dominated and I was super happy and super excited for the season. But it's been, um, it's been a bit of a roller coaster since then. You know, you try and give it one more game because, you know, maybe they beat Colorado too and they come home to play San Jose, you know, up to uh, or, or having won two games this season in a row. And uh, no, then uh, they got they, they kind of got smoked a little bit. So I listen to uh, a lot of Flyers podcasts, and that's one of the reasons why it inspired me to start one. Um, I listen to Broad Street Hockey Radio, which I love. I think they're great. Uh, I started listening to um, Bully in It, I think is what it's called. I'm going to double check right now on my phone. So, Or Getting Bullied, sorry. Getting Bullied, um, I also listen to. Um, and always open to listen to more if you guys want to throw some stuff down in the comments for me to listen to. Uh, I just love listening to hockey stuff. Love being into hockey stuff. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, a lot of what was said in this week has been super doom and gloom, and it's hard not to be. Um, I even tweeted last night, you know, uh, Sam Carcitti tweeted that Coots said it's not time to panic, and uh, I said, well, fuck you, Coots. Um, you know, make a play, basically, because uh, I don't think it's time to panic. It's still real early in the season. We're only 10 games in, but the way that this team is going uh, is super concerning, super concerning, and... I'm not here to be doom and gloom. I'm not here to be everything sucks. Um, I'm going to be here to basically outline why they should fire Dave Haxtall without having to say those words again. Um, just what's happening in the offensive zone is not good. Um, you know, if you go back and you look at some of the stuff that I did last season, you will see that I am not a Haxtall lover at all. Um, I think Ian LaPerriere needs to be fired. I did a whole uh, podcast about the penalty kill. And, um, yeah, uh, you know, Knobloch isn't really doing anything with the power play right now. They have the 12th, no, uh, 20 something worst power play in the league. Uh, their 12th in goals four. that's where I got that number from, but we'll get all into that in a minute. Um, yeah, I think, I think a lot of us agree that part of the problem with the flyers is that. Uh, they are a perimeter playing team. They play on the outside during the power play. They even do it now five on five. Uh, so many shots come from the point, but I don't think we recognize and realize how many come from the point. Um, one of the things that I'm going to try and do in this video is I'm go going to try and put um, a graph from HockeyViz.com. Uh, it's a heat map that shows where most of the flyer shots are coming from. I'm going to try and put it in this general vicinity, uh, whether it's now or in a couple minutes, I'm going to try and have it pop up uh, so that you guys can kind of see what it looks like. I'll move over a little bit just so that it has some space. Um, so you guys can kind of see where their shots are coming from. Um, and it's it's the perimeter. It's the outside. And uh, how I found out about Hockey Viz, I've seen, you know, different heat maps and stuff posted on Twitter. And uh, I finally Googled, you know, heat maps and stuff so I could start looking at that stuff. And I've, I've taken a, a very big uh, turn into advanced metrics and stuff, trying to learn about that stuff so I can have better uh, content. And Hockey Viz is where I found it. And uh, yeah, I'm going to try and post it for you guys. It's bad. It's bad. Uh, you know, the, the article that I found their, their stuff in says that it's critical to scoring goals uh, to be in the slot. To be in front of the net is where you need to be to score goals. And I know that that seems like a duh thing to say, but apparently no one's told Dave Haxtall or Knobloch and nobody's told Ian LaPeria that that's where you need to defend. You know, there was, there was the DeBrusque goal last night against Boston uh, was egregious. There was no, Andrew McDonald was staring at Jake DeBrusque's, DeBrusque's back. And uh, even if you look right before Ryan Donato ran into Brian Elliott, 
he was by himself. He he had a good 10 seconds where it was literally just him in front of the net and both defenders were higher than him watching the puck. And it's disgusting. There's no there's no uniformity to this defense. Um but that's where you need to be to score goals and that's not where the Flyers are and somehow they're still 12th in goals for when they've been shut out twice in 10 games, which simple math, 20% of the time they're being shut out. That's not good. That's not good. So um, I just want to go over shots. I'm going to go as basic as I can. Uh, team leads in shots in the 10 games that we've had so far this season. Uh, in the Vegas win, Wayne Simmons led with four. Michael Roffel had three. Another person with three was Robert Haig. Uh, why Robert Haig had three shots, I don't know. He's, he does not, to me, have a plus shot. There's moments in time where he has a plus shot, but for him to be one of the league lead, or one of the uh, team leaders in shots is upsetting. Uh, then we had Colorado. Coots had four. Simmons had four. Ghost had four shots. Uh, San Jose. Simmons had four. Patrick had four. G had four. And then we had uh, Amac with three, tied with Yuri Laterra. And Ghost had six shots. Um, Ottawa. G had seven. Uh, Scott Lawton had five. Simmer had four. Ghost had six again. And Gudis had three. Again, not a lot. When I think about... Even six for Ghost is a lot, but I understand because the guy's got a hell of a shot. He's definitely got a plus shot. I would say Provorov went on, has a slightly above average to above average shot, and and Sanheim has a, a slightly above average to above average shot. Radko Gudas doesn't. Robert Haig doesn't. Andrew McDonald doesn't. You know, the rest of the defense should not be taking three to, to five shots a game, uh, and we'll get more into that in a minute. Uh, in the other Vegas game, uh, Hag and Ghost had four shots apiece, and right behind them with three was Coots and Jake. Uh, in the Florida win, a Florida win that was uh, a win in a shootout, which I consider to be a loss because you can't give up three consecutive goals and send it into a shootout without. Yeah, there was a loss in my brain. But uh, G had eight, uh, TK and Jake had four, and Hag had two. Shots on goal. Columbus, Lindblom had six. G had five. Jake had four. And then we had Haig, Provy, Ghost, and Folan all had two shots on goal. Uh, the Devils win. Provy and TK had three shots each. The Colorado lost. G had five. Sanheim had five. Gudis and Prolarov both had both had four. Uh, in Boston, G had five. Sanheim had four. Haig and Provy had two. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's where we're at. So there's two D-men in the top five in the team in shots. Ghost and and Haig, two players that Ghost is his shooting percentage is under four percent right now, and and part of that you have to believe is bad luck, but it's still not great. And he's fired the third most shots on the team, second most shots on the team. I can't remember; I didn't make a note of it here, but I should have. Uh, the other person in the top five is Robert Haig. Again, not a guy that I would be instilling a lot of confidence in uh, because I do not believe him to have a plus shot. Um, if he has the opportunity, if he's in between the dots and he, he sneaks down and wants to, to take a rip, there was a shot last night in Boston where he was up top by himself and had about 10 feet of ice. He could have skated in and let a shot go from right above the hash marks or shit in between the dots. Like, and he, he decided to let a one-timer go from, from the blue line. He was literally on the blue line. Um, so by defensemen, the Flyers have – Ghost has 30 shots. Haig has 20. Sandheim has 16. Provorov has 16. Gudis has 11. Amak and Folan both have six for a total of 105 shots. The team has taken a total of 312 shots. And in case you were wondering, yes, I already did the math. The defensemen have accounted for 34% of the shots the Philadelphia Flyers have taken this year. So one in every three plus. Um, you're not going to win that way. You're not going to win that way. You know, there's there's genuinely not enough offense uh, being being put to, to the middle. You know, that's that's where you're going to score. That's where you're going to score your goals. We don't have a sniper. We don't have an Austin Matthews, a John Tavares, uh, a Connor McDavid that can score from the wings and pick a corner. Those that's just not the kind of, of team this is. And and you know, Bill Mass says it all the time on on Broad Street Hockey Radio, but. This team is an east to west team. They they try and get the goalie moving because that's how they're going to score because they don't have a sniper. Well, it's time to go get a sniper. I'm sorry. When your defense is taking 34% of your shots, it something's wrong. 
something is wrong. It just be this isn't the old NHL anymore. You know, you're not allowed you you're not allowed to park someone in front of the net and bump the goalie and and it's just it's not it's not the way that it's done anymore. And the Flyers have gotten so far away from from driving the net and forcing play. To me, it seems like this team is playing not to lose and they're not playing to win. You know, the the moments that they looked best against Boston last night was when, to me at least, when they were giving up chances. And that seems kind of weird, but the only way this team is going to win games is in firefights. They're only going to win when they can they can counterattack and uh, attack and counterattack, attack and counterattack, because they're not a good defensive team. They're not a defensively sound team. They can't break the puck out. So their best chance to get the puck out of the defensive zone is going to be when you know, the forwards are crashing up the ice and there's one defenseman on one forward who's back checking and there's a line change happening. The, that's the only way to me that this team is going to generate offense. They, they do not have the ability to have a consistent breakout. They don't push the puck up the ice. Their neutral zone, uh, you know, defense is decent, but for whatever reason, again, they're just, they're playing, scared they're playing scared they're they're trying to keep people from going into the defensive zone and trying not to take chances so they dish everything to the point but then the point men get poke checked or they get you know they flub a pass which has happened so many times this season they've missed so many passes this season you know I can't tell there's no game that I've seen where the passes are crisp or look like they're 100 percent on um and it, it just it hurts the team. It hurts the team. It looks bad. And again, 34% of the shots for the Flyers have been taken by the defensemen, which is disturbing. Andrew McDonald and Christian Fallen both haven't played the full 10 games, but each have six, six shots on goal. And neither of them have, have what I would even consider to be an average shot. McDonald maybe sometimes. I mean, even a broke clock's right two times a day, but... You know, him and Fullen both, I would consider to not, you know, Gudis has a heavy shot. I don't, it's one of those things that you hear the announcers say and, and hear other people say, he's got a heavy shot. For whatever reason, it might not be the hardest shot. It's not Ovechkin 104 miles an hour crazy, but it's heavy. It hits and, and you're typically going to get a rebound from it. But he shouldn't be taking as many shots as he takes. Hag doesn't have, Hag, Hag, whatever, doesn't have, you know, a shot that I value as someone who should be taking 20 shots. He's taking two shots. He's on average two shots a game and they're not good. So I also will try and put up uh, the, the uh, shots from last night. Uh, uh, another one again from hockey Viz. I'll try and put it up in this, this corner. Sorry, mirror image. Um, I'll try and put it up in this corner. So you guys can see 16 of their shots came from outside the circles, 16. And then there was one by Corbin Knight, which 17. I didn't count that one, but there's one from Corbin Knight, which is, uh, was a backhand. I assume it was supposed to be a dump, but it was a backhand from literally behind the blue line. So this team isn't fast enough to play a dump and chase game, which is something that when they generate offense, they try and do. And when they're in the offensive zone, they just try and play on the perimeter, and that's not going to get it done. They need someone who can drive the net. They need someone who can – they need a Mike Knubel, but in the NHL today. Mike Knubel would die in the NHL today because he didn't have the legs for it, but they need a Mike Knubel. They need someone who will drive the net in the center lane. They need a Scott Hartnell. They need someone who will do that, and for whatever reason, this coaching staff doesn't value that. This coaching staff – apparently wants them to play along the outside, which is just not the way to do this. So very upset um, with all of those shenanigans, but um, continuing on uh, with some of the stuff that I think, I think that could obviously help them be more productive in the offensive zone. Uh, I want to switch gears to the penalty kill. Um, Again, last year I, uh, I had a whole uh, episode about the penalty kill and Ian LaPerriere. So Feel free to go back and uh, and watch that if you'd like to be frustrated. But um, right now the Flyers are first in uh, goals allowed. And like I said before, they're 12th in goals four. You're not going to win that way. You're just not. Uh, the Panthers are the only penalty kill that's behind the Flyers. And Carolina is ahead of them by 3%, which at this point of the season feels pretty substantial. Um 
again, you, you look at DeBrusque last night by himself. Andrew McDonald was staring at his back. Um, and, and Donato right before, right before that Elliot, uh, you know, scuffle Donato was by himself. He was literally by himself. He had no one challenging him. Both defensemen. I'm not even sure knew he was there until he was forcing Brian Elliott into the net. So something needs to change. Um, Ian LaPerrier. I think this whole coaching staff needs to be fired and I would like to just get that out of the way. Um, they're just not, they're not capable uh in my eyes you know there's they have the opportunity they have the ability but they um they just refuse to make changes so i um i think they need to be gone but in spite of doing that uh there just needs to be changes made i think the penalty kill needs to be more aggressive uh i think they need to attack the puck more you know um again going to bsh radio wayne simmons scores all of his goals from in front of the net he scores all of his power play goals with a tip or some in front of the net. He is in front of the net getting murdered by other defensemen, you know, Victor Hedman's of the world and, and Aaron Ekblatt's and, you know, those guys are cross checking him in the spine every game he plays them because he's posting up in front of the net, trying to tip a puck and deflect it in the flyers do not give a shit. And that has not been more clear than last night. Um, you know, I, I can't harp on it enough. The DeBrusque goal was, was awful. Another goal that sticks out that wasn't on the power play, but was terrible was the uh, Anthony Duclair goal against the blue jackets. That was, um, Oh my Lord, that gave me heart palpitations and still does sometimes. But yeah, Carolina is right, right ahead of us in the PK, but they are still one of the best teams in the league because they score goals. They play, uh, they average 40 shots a game. I was doing, you know, research obviously before this and they average 40 shots a game, 40, the flyers average 31.3. And that's not terrible, but Carolina makes up for it because they're driving the puck on net constantly. And, you know, they're, I, I didn't look at their heat map, but I'm sure it's from higher percentage places than uh, than the Flyers. And, and Rod Brendamore knows where to score goals. He knows where to go to score goals. And he's obviously, you know, got the Hurricanes playing and, and bought into that style of play because they're winning. They're winning games and the Flyers aren't. So uh, something needs to change. Uh, you know, I said it before and I said it last year. The, the PK is not ready and they're not capable of playing. Uh up to a level that needs that it needs to be you know Ron Hextall made a comment it was either Hextall or Hackstall I can't remember which one it was because they they just they're the same person to me at this point um and they said that the penalty kill looks visual visibly better this year than it did last year the stats just don't match up and that is the most garbage thing I think I've ever heard in my entire life I believe it was a Hextall quote um because it's it's bullshit. They are actively a worse team on the penalty kill. There's one team behind the Florida Panthers are the only team they did that did not they didn't even win a game for what six games into the season and they're the only team that has a worse penalty kill than the Flyers who are basically a 500 team at this point. I I just don't I don't understand where this is coming from and I think there needs to be changes up top, but again, I'm just trying to there, – there are fixes. There's things that need to be done to make this team better. And, and if, you know, by some off chance that they decide to make these changes, I think this team can compete. I think there's just too much talent on this this team for there not to be good. You know, uh, you know having connect me back on the top line last night I think was a great idea. It didn't result in anything last night, but I think it's a great idea. Um, you know, moving Simmons back down in the lineup, I think is best for him because his five on five play as every Flyers fan should know is not good. Wayne Simmons scores more than half of his goals on the power play. He is a special teams. uh, He's, he's a special teams prodigy, but when it comes to being a five on five skater, he is lacking. He's everything I love in a flyer. He's gritty. He's physical. He says what needs to be done. He has no teeth. Like he's everything I want in a flyer but he does not play a good five on five game at this point in his career. And I am perfectly okay with them letting him walk at the end of the season, which will, I'm sure will, will get me garbage from people on the internet, but it's just my opinion. You know, I don't, I'm not saying that I'm right. I'm not saying that I'm wrong. I'm just saying that I think these things would help this team, you know, a more uh, aggressive penalty kill will definitely help them uh, take away time and space. 
take away time and space from the other team because then what are they going to do? You know, one of the best penalty killers in recent memory that I can think of that I got to watch, you know, his entire Flyers tenure was Mike Richards. And he was constantly attacking the points, constantly attacking the points, constantly putting pressure on people. And he still might have the most or second most shorthanded goals in Flyers history. I think the guy's doing something right. I think he's doing something right. So another thing that I think would be interesting, and uh, I, I also expect to get a little bit of, of garbage from, from individuals, and I don't think that this is going to happen. I, by no means do I think that this is going to be something that happens. Um, I, I foresee the Flyers staying pat. I don't think Dave Haxtell is going to get fired in season unless, unless Comcast Spectacore comes in and they tell Ron Hextall that he either needs to fire Hack or he's gone and they'll do it, um, then I think he might. He might just resign right then and there. Um, but my, my fear is that Dean Lombardi then becomes the general manager, and I definitely don't want that. So um, I know that there's been a lot of buzz in the NHL and in Flyer world, especially as things have gotten worse, about William Nylander. And I love William Nylander, and I do not – absolutely do not think that the Flyers are going to trade for him. But my package for Nylander would be uh, Phil Myers and Oscar Lindblom for like William Nylander and a third or a fourth round pick um, just to get, you know, create some space. Um, and for me, Nylander plugs into the top six, top nine. You know, if that means that you have to then move a Jake Voracek down, you have to then move a JVR to the third line when he comes back healthy. If that means whatever, then I think you need to do it. Um, this kid's 22 years old and has put up in his first two seasons, has put up 61 points in the NHL. He's a kid. He's not even reached his full potential yet. And he's put up more points in these two years than Travis Konechny did last year. And... I think, uh, I think they need to take a run at him. Um, you know, like I said, I think the only way this team wins is with an offensive first system. I think they need to win games six, five, instead of losing games three to one. Um, and ne William Nylander helps that he can play center. He can play wing. So he slots into multiple different places in the lineup. Uh, and if you, you have Sean Couturier, Claude Giroux, TK is your first line. I think you're a second line with Nolan Patrick, William Nylander, and Jake Voracek, or or whoever you want to plug in, JVR and Jake, or Nylander drop. I just don't – there's there's spots opening up here in the NHL – or in, you know, for the NHL team here really soon. And that's why I say give Lindblom up because we don't really know what Lindblom is. And if a Lindblom – helps you get a Nylander giving up Lindblom helps you get Nylander I think you have to do it it creates that opening on the third line for assuming JVR to slide down because that's where he was to start the season anyway um you know and and the Flyers currently have eight million in cap space I think Nylander would take seven I think he'd take seven for three four five years whatever it is apparently his asking price is eight but I think he'd take seven uh you're gonna lose some cap uh with you know, giving up Lindblom, not much. It's like, it's about a million dollars, but I think you need to make a play for him. Or if I was GM, I would make a play for him and that would put us right back up against the cap. And I realized that that sucks. But what I didn't realize is the flyers have $24 million or just about $24 million coming off the cap next year. So next year they lose Wayne Simmons, Jerry Laterra, uh, Jordan wheel, Scott Lawton, Travis Konechny, Corbin Knight, Ivan Provorov, Travis Sanheim, Christian Folan, Brian Elliott, Michael Neuvert, and Michael Roffel all come off the books to a, a tune of about $24 million. I'm assuming they re-sign Scott Lawton for about $2 million a year. Uh, TK gets about four max. Uh, you know, if, if Nylander's asking for eight and he's generated 61 points, I, I don't, it's TK generated 47 last year. And most of that was in the second half of the season. So I don't know how he could ask for more than four, maybe five. Um, Ivan Provorov gets between five and six, depending on what happens to him the rest of the year, because he has not played well. Um, Travis Sanheim, I got it for four, five mil, maybe even less because this will be his first full season, hopefully in the NHL. Um, and I don't have them re-signing anyone else. So that's two, six, and taking the maximum for both 12, 
uh, seventeen million dollars. So you then have seven million dollars to sign two goalies, uh, or or what I would what I think is going to be one goalie because uh, Alex Lyon only has a one way contract next year. So even if he goes to the Phantoms and has to pass through waivers in order to do that, he's going to make seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. So I think the Flyers think he's going to be the backup goaltender next year. Um, I don't know. Seven, $7 million sure as shit feels like uh, a lot of money to be able to spend and go get a decent goaltender. You know, maybe bring Bob back. I know that's been floated around uh, in the Flyers' atmosphere. But, uh, you know, Carter Hart's not going to be ready next year. From what it looks like, he's struggling right now in the AHL. He does not look like he's going to be ready to be a number one guy next year. And you have Lyon, and I don't think Lyon's a starter either. I wouldn't bank on Alex Lyon playing 60 games. You know, he... I think his ceiling is decent backup goalie, uh, you know, steal you a game or two. Uh, I look at him as a Brian Boucher type, and I love Brian Boucher. I have a Brian Boucher jersey. He's one of my favorite Flyers goalies of all time uh, just for that save he made on Patrick Eliash. But um, I definitely see him as a Boucher type, uh, you know, fringe, fringe goalie. You know, Boucher at his best was never a number one. So... Uh, I, yeah, ultimately that's what I think. I think you need to make a play for William Nylander. I think, um, you know, you need to be a more aggressive penalty kill and you need to generate more chances from the slot. You need to take the puck in, get it between the dots and let it rip because they, they currently don't do that. And most teams I'll also put up when I talk about the penalty kill, um, in this, nope, this one, this spot, again, I will try and put the heat map for, um, them the the shots that they allow uh on the five on five and on penalty kill because they're all right in front of the net they are all high danger areas the penalty kill one is disturbing because it is literally from the the corner of the crease all the way up into into the slot and that's that is bright brightly colored because that's where they let teams sit there's no there's no punishment for going there so uh, yeah, I mean, that's really all I have for you guys for our first Florida Flyer. Uh, sometimes I'll do an Around the NHL segment. I don't, I'm don't. i not prepared to do one of those. Um, I've been really busy recently, so I, didn't, I haven't gotten to watch as much hockey as I would have liked. But um, Carolina Hurricanes so far, surprise to me. I, I would have never saw that coming. Scott Darling and Peter Mrazek as their goaltenders. But they made some nice trades in the offseason. Dougie Hamilton, I'm sure, is ripping it up in, in Carolina. Um, but... Would have loved to see him in orange and black because we, we definitely need it. But ultimately, yeah, that's that's in summary, that's that's what I feel about our Flyers. I think that they need to uh, generate more offense from the slot. Stop relying so heavily on defensemen to get shots into the net uh, because that's also contributing to turnovers and odd man rushes and everything that is bad. Um you know, Andrew McDonald on a two on one because, you know, Travis Sanheim got a shot blocked is horrifying because you know what he's going to do. He's going to starfish. The guy's going to deke around the goalie and Andrew McDonald, and he's going to score. It's super simple. It's very easy, and we've seen it happen too many times to know that it's going to be any different. So uh, rely less on defensive shots and perimeter play. Uh, go get William Nylander. Go get William Nylander, uh, you know, and, and play a wide-open game. Fire Ian LaPerriere. Honestly, just fire Ian LaPerriere. Let the players go out and do what they want on the penalty kill. Let them go do whatever they want because it can't be any worse. It literally can't be any worse. Um, and, yeah, I mean, uh, hopefully this team gets everything sorted out. And, uh, you know, the next time I do one of these, which will hopefully be next week, it'll be a little more fun, a little more exciting. So, uh, yeah, if you guys have any questions, comments, whatever you'd like to see on the future episodes of the Florida Flyer, uh, just let me know. Um, you can comment on this video, like, subscribe. Uh, I'm going to post this, I think, on Facebook and on uh, my my podcasts uh, YouTube channel so yeah just uh, any questions fire them in the comments and I, I'd love to answer them guys so thank you so much uh, and hopefully we see some more good hockey from the Flyers guys thanks